Welcome to Breaking Paradigms, a podcast where we talk about global perspectives on spatial planning in practice and theory by Constance Frech and Sarah Kouchy. Today we want to talk about the car and the city. Cars are a fairly recent addition to the city, yet arguably they have shaped our city more than any other mode of transportation. In this episode we will talk a bit about the idea of the automotive city, in German Autogerechte Stadt, and how its legacy influences city planning around the world in present day and past endangering food security, health and many other factors of life. But more on that later. First, let's talk about the concept of the automotive city. To put it in the simplest way, the idea is to plan a city or town that individual motorized vehicles such as cars or trucks have access and prioritize them over other modes of transportation. A very practical example of this are pedestrian underpasses. Instead of a normal crossing where you would need to stop and potentially wait to continue, you build a system where no interaction is necessary. But when building, you let pedestrians walk under, therefore needing more energy to cross and exposing the pedestrians to an additional factor such as feeling uncomfortable, as most people do in underpasses. Depending on the build, maybe limiting access to certain groups of people. For example, if there are stairs, wheelchair users will not be able to access it. All whilst prioritizing the vehicle passing over, which can save a bit of energy and pass comfortably. This is not to say that there are no instances where underpasses or overpasses do make sense. However, the automotive city does not only influence the paths of transportation, It also influences zoning, meaning the location of industry, shopping areas and living space, just to name a few. As a car can transport you much further in the same amount of time as your feet might. This makes it possible and feasible to allocate space quite far away from one another. An example of this would be supermarkets on the fringes of the town, which might only be accessible by car limiting access for people who can't use cars, either because of disability like blindness or other mobility issues, or children and young people who are not allowed to drive, as well as people with less economic means who simply can't afford car use. Another one are large shopping malls outside of the city limits or industrial areas far away from living areas. This is to say, that not all separation is inherently bad due to no noise reduction or pollution. However, streets and especially parking spaces, which often accompany these allotments, seal a lot of area and through this phenomena severely impact the water absorption, biodiversity and long-term usability of the ground. In Austria, the rate of sealing ground is among the highest in Europe, And according to Kurt Weinberger, head of the Austrian Hagelversicherung, warns that it will have significant impact on food security, especially in connection with causing more severe weather due to lack of absorption of water and CO2. The very first thing which pops up in my head when I hear the automotive city, I think of Brasilia. It's a very unique example to me because, or in general, because uh, Brasilia was designed to be the new capital of Brazil uh, in the 1950s, late 1950s, beginning of 1960s. At that time, uh, the, the president of Brazil wanted to start a new era of, of Brazil his slogan of his campaign for the elections was 50 years in five years. So his idea was to speed up Brazil's development. And the beginning for that development should be a, a new capital. The shape the city has today was planned by Lucio Costa. And we have to think of the time that happened. It was the late 50s and it was um, the beginning of the broad accessibility 
of people to cars. And so um, the car was the symbol for development uh, and progress. And so it was, it's pretty logical that the car had an important role in this um, in this progressive development they, they wanted to have. It's this kind of example that at the time was made also as an exemplary product of this mm. idealized automotive concept. Mm. What I find fascinating about the city of Brasilia as well, even though I don't know that much about it, I've never been, um, is the idea that a city is like really constructed around certain planning ideas and therefore kind of like very technologically the most advanced city at the time, I guess. Uh, mm. in terms of, of how a should, city should be. And then when we look back on it today, the feeling is quite different. As far as I experienced from my short visit of two or three days, when you walk through Brasilia, you never have the feeling of this urbanity you have in all other cities I visited in South America. I think that's actually a very interesting point because the um, aspect of, on the one hand, kind of creating this almost museum-esque um, situation and then when you go into more the uh, like hardcore other spectrum, um, which is uh, in, in informal settlements and um, especially in informal settlement upgrading, one thing that I find very interesting because of course it's the opposite it wasn't planned that way um, it's uh, it comes out of the need for infrastructure need for transportation etc in a local settlement um, so you kind of have this aspect of needing certain things that of course come also from a culture that's very car oriented all of our supply chains all of our um whether that's the fire brigade the police um or an ambulance they're all more or less the same width of course with some differentiations but the idea of this kind of uh, two and a half meters wide road to facilitate one car passing, as I said, depends a bit, of course, a fire truck might actually be bigger than that, but uh, on average. And um, I find that very interesting that when it comes, for example, to slum upgrading um, or informal settlement upgrading, it's almost a standard or it is a standard probably in at least in most of the policies that I've seen that you follow certain widths of the road, which are usually very much oriented towards car widths. And I find that very interesting because, of course, that doesn't influence, like in Brasilia, the allocation of the shops or living space or embassies or whatever immediately. But I do think that it does have an, an impact because, of course, the urban fabric is a lot more dense when you just have footpaths through it, which means there is no access for, for example, a fire brigade um, or a police car or an ambulance. But um, on the other hand, it also, I think, creates a different type of urbanity, different type of, of local flair than uh, a city that is separated by cars, a city which usually then, little by little, a lot of things like parking spaces, etc. And of course, that also comes in conjunction with wealth. Um, which I think is also one of the topics, especially in informal settlement upgrading, that you attribute this kind of wealth with cars to this day, that if you have a car, you have a certain status. And I found it very interesting. Um, Trevor Noah, who is a comedian from South Africa, uh, did a little sketch on the topic that um, 
he, they had a uh, garage in their house in Soweto, but they never had a car simply because it was this kind of aspirational thing to have at least a garage, even though you didn't have a car. And um, I think that's also something that influences our thinking as planners a lot, that all of these standards are very much based on a thing that is uh, seen almost as a fact of life and not really questioned why do you need a card to pass through here. I think it's something that to a certain extent when it comes to social infrastructure and so on, um, you can think about, hey, we need certain access, um, but do does really every house need access to a road or not? And it's not so much that that answer needs to be a definite no, but I think it's simply asking that question that makes already a difference. And I remember you were telling me that in your experience in Shanghai, uh, that there, because of uh, some areas being quite tight knit, um, they do have, for example, special vehicles um, that uh, are uh, fire trucks to help in case of emergency that are a bit more small and therefore can have the like it's the reverse there were small streets and they needed to pass through there so they created a car or a truck that would fit through that um i understand that like the logic behind it depends also a bit on the on the needs that you have as a city and whether you even can construct something because of course densities are also very different. If it's hard for a human to fit through something, maybe it's not so easy to build a truck that can pass. But I think it's something that we also can ask ourselves, what are the actual requirements and how do our cities accommodate that? And how does creating streets that are comparatively really wide, um, if you've ever been in an informal settlement that's quite dense, of course, there are also some that are really not dense and then it's a, a different story. But if you've been in a dense urban settlement um, that didn't have streets, it didn't it doesn't feel uncomfortable as such, but uh, it just has a completely different um, atmosphere to it because there are no cars just passing through. You might have some motorcycles, you might have other forms of transportation, but um, yeah. I, I think the, the general uh, question for me in terms of the automotive set, the city is, do we question enough our willingness to always plan for cars first? I also had to think of uh, Trevor Noah's story with the garage and uh, it made me smile. <laughs> I think that it's also... Um, a question of rethinking our habits and our uh, daily routines. What, what role cars play in our daily life? Uh, I have to think in that case of uh, a big furniture shop everyone knows. They have a shop in, in, ha in Hamburg in Altona, which is a fairly dense, not too central part of, of Hamburg. And they built this big furniture shop to Altona and they were pretty proud of this project because it was the very first uh, furniture shop of that kind within the city boundaries and not on the city's outskirts. And the specific thing was that this furniture shop did not have any garages, but was close to the train. So one could easily access by train. And in the beginning, everyone was pretty happy that they have this furniture shop in the very city center. Or in a central, more central area, not city center. Um, but after a while, it was financially not that successful. Why was that? Uh, apparently, because there was a second shop of that kind of furniture shop on the city's outskirts. And so every Hamburg person would rather go outside by car and get their furniture there instead of go to the one in the close to the city center. Uh, because in their mind, it was when I go to this shop, I would have, I would always you get a car before, even if I don't own a car, I would rent a car or borrow a car to get to the furniture shop to get my furniture. 
even though the shop close to the city center offered all kinds of delivery or you could also get heavy duty bikes. So there were absolutely possibilities to get your furniture home. It was not a big deal, but people were just, they had in their mind, if I go to the furniture shop, I have to have a car. And for the reason that you couldn't park there, they they would never go to the one in the city center. They would just rather go far to the outskirts because they had a car anyway. To rethink that and think, okay, do I really need to go buy a car there? Do, do I actually buy that much stuff that I need a car? Secondly, is the car the only possibility to, to move my furniture? They never thought about that. They just said, okay, I go to a furniture shop, therefore I need a car. Even though many people don't even own a car, but they just rented one or borrowed one. But yeah, I think in general that I I think it's this two way thing that we need to think of how we do things and why the car plays such an important role. And I think in cities, that's also another discussion because we're specifically talking about the automotive city, not about cars in general, because I think the discussion is a completely different one when you go into a lot less dense areas and you go into the countryside where um, certain private mobility is also an issue especially for people who don't have access to cars due to a variety of reasons, like we said before in the episode. That is one side of the spectrum. And then in cities, uh, which usually have other ways of either transportation or service provision, because very often you have cities that have quite dense service provision, especially if I think of a city like Vienna, where uh, literally by foot I can reach any type of store including like a hardware store uh, or things that would normally be considered maybe more um, car like needing a car um, to as you said before for transportation or for other things and I think that's uh, then there is on the one hand the way that we think ourselves and we decide ourselves but it's also I think part of the way how we design a city has to do with what do we want to offer the citizens? Do we have alternatives? Do we prioritize um, certain modes of transportation? Like in Vienna, I think is a prime example of prioritizing public transportation. And um, therefore there is good public transportation provision. While if you think of a lot of uh, places elsewhere, Uh, that prioritize car use, for example. Um, You can also very much see that in the the makeup of the city and in the habits of the the citizens. I think I've never been to a city where I've seen so many people with furniture in a subway car as in Vienna. Um, And like, I have to admit myself, I moved at least half of my furniture from one apartment to the other just by public transportation. Yes, there are certain things that you can't move but um if if your first thought is hey i could use public transportation hey i could use a heavy duty bike it's a different kind of atmosphere to live in than when your only option is a car um so yeah i think that's that's something also to consider and a good point that you made i just had to think of a holiday i had in the u.s Uh, I did a road trip with um, a very good friend for a few weeks in uh, in the US and Canada. And since we did a road trip, of course, we had a car. And I remember we parked our car at the motel. And then we saw that there was a supermarket pretty close from our motel. And we thought we could get some groceries there. And so we started our walk and then we got lost and we thought, oh, damn it, (laughs) where's where's the shop? And um, so we stepped by at at a gas station and asked for the shop. And apparently we uh, we had gone like the wrong direction. So we uh, and the shopkeeper said, oh, yeah, it's easy. It's like two minutes from here. 
And uh, and I was like, okay, right. Two minutes seemed too short because we walked at least five to get to the gas, sta- gas station. And after a while, he realized that we were walking. And he was totally confused and asked us, like, why the hell we would walk that and not just take a car? So he was so, totally surprised that one would ever move within this this town not by car. You could actually tell from the streets because there was hardly any sidewalks. Um, so we basically uh, just walked on the grass next to the streets. Finally, we found the store and it was like, I don't know, a little longer than two minutes, but it was totally doable. And I think it also goes to show how the, like, how much we assign certain space. I find that super interesting that one of the questions in on our previous video um, where we asked what other um, topics you would like to hear from us. Um, and one of the comments was about the uh, COVID-19 situation and uh, in Vienna we are having this discussion about the use of the streets in order to keep so, uh, the opportunity for social distancing. People I asked, they said, uh, why not just open all the um, the areas that have a speed limit of 30 kilometers per hour um, just to say, okay, every place where cars have to go slow anyways and the difference between a concept of shared space or Begegnungszone, how they call it in Austria, uh, where it's 20 kilometers per hour as the maximum speed limit to 30 kilometers per hour speed limit. There, the difference isn't that high. Why not just open all the streets um, that have a lower speed limit? Of course, to have some streets that are um, main roads where um, as we talked before as well in terms of, of upgrading to have certain service provision be possible, you need higher ranking streets and, uh, and in, a, in a dense city, I also see the point of that, but then also to open it much more widely while, for example, in the district where I live, there's only one street that is uh, was added as an, as an open street and in a lot of districts it was a bit more, but I was quite surprised because in the district where I live, there's a lot of small streets that do have a lot of potential of just being a shared uh, space. And I think it's then also a question of where do we allot the space? And I think when I look in my environment, one of the biggest uses of space is parked cars, especially in the streets. It's not just the moving cars that need space, but it's also the parked cars that need space. And I know that like there are certain legislations in in Austria and in Vienna that try to alleviate that situation in general. But I find it very interesting that in terms of space allocation, we prioritize cars in whichever form, whether that's moving or standing, um, to an extent that we don't uh, give to space for children or green spaces to relax in, which I think would have also a lot of additional benefits for for us as a society of the people who actually live here, uh, rather than just a space for, for some metal to be stationed at. So, uh, I think that this whole discussion on social distancing is also um, interesting because, yes, there are a lot of spaces where it's not possible to keep a meter or two of distance simply because the sidewalks are not large enough. And like you said in your story before, there, for example, you didn't even have any sidewalks. Where do we prioritize this? And when we plan new things, how do we how do we allocate that space? When I'm thinking of, of newer built areas, whether that's the Seestadt concept in Vienna or the Hafen City Hamburg, that are very European areas, there's always an implicit kind of opportunity for cars to um, to have access. And I don't know if it just comes from the idea of we need to have 
space to access with an ambulance or if it's more out of this okay we need to build a street because how else would you like just having that mindset as what you said before the concept on the other end of the spectrum is the so-called walkable city in german stadt der kurzen wege we will focus on this concept in our next episode but what do you think is the future of the automotive city will we continue to orient our planning on cars Or do you think other standards will influence our cities? Let us know in the comments or send us an email at info at breakingparadigms.org and check out our new shop with merch for planners at breakingparadigms.org slash shop.